Hi, I'm Dr. David Winter, and welcome to Google's Healthy Hangout, sponsored by Baylor Scott & White Health. We're bringing timely topics on medicine. Today's topic is the Ebola virus. Lots of interest in this. The World Health Organization says it's an international emergency. We've got uh, almost 2,000 people with the disease worldwide. We're going to talk about that. Roger, uh, international uh, expert in internal medicine, Roger Caton, welcome. Thank you, sir. We have Dr. Cedric Spock, an infectious disease specialist. Welcome, Dr. Spock. Thank you so much. So, Roger, you're seeing patients, I'm sure, that are asking about this virus. Uh, what do you tell them to try to give them some reassurance we have some way we can at least identify or, or understand this virus? A lot of times, you know, more information is better. So we are giving our patients, when they ask us about how long does it take to be incubated, we say two days to 21 days. We're referring them to our website for the Baylor, Health, Baylor Scott and White Health website, as well as the CDC website. We also are very concerned about people who are coming back from Nigeria on mission trips or from uh, Northern Africa. And then I always say Dr. Uh, Spock will be the one who I'll need to refer them to if there's a real high concern for Ebola virus. Yeah, the concern, this is the biggest outbreak of this virus in the world history. Before this, Barely over 100 people ever had it at one time, but now almost 2,000. Dr. Spock, any idea why this virus is more widespread than any other one in the history of the world? Well, I think the way to look at it is uh, remembering the different epidemics we've had in the past. Epidemics will frequently come in an almost an explosive fashion. When you look at, say, uh, SARS or MERS, you know, you'll see this poof, and then typically it kind of subsides. When it comes to Ebola, there's a lot of things that are not known rather than what's known. For example, it's not known how many individuals have asymptomatic infection. Um, and no one has, as of yet, been able to do a good population-based study to look and see, all right, we've had 10,000 people that have evidence of past infection, and they didn't even know they were infected. So although the media and the appropriate healthcare authorities are bringing up concerns about Ebola, we actually don't scientifically know how concerned we really need to be. Um, the best way to counsel patients is that influenza is 100 times more contagious than Ebola. And what's remarkable is, is as we know as all physicians when we talk to patients about influenza, how difficult it is to give them common sense advice about avoiding sick contacts, et cetera, et cetera, with influenza because of how contagious it can be. You know, the scary thing about this virus, historically, it's been said that it can kill up to 90% of people that are infected, which may be one reason that it dies out quickly. It kills off a whole village, and it has no place to propagate. It's also said the virus comes can come from bats or from monkeys. It's even been uh, mentioned in dogs and pigs, but mainly in Africa where we see this virus, it's the bats and the monkeys over there. So, you know, Roger, uh, how likely are we to see this in this country right now in your view? A very low risk uh, for us in this country, but we are a global society, as you know, and all of us have been traveling a lot. A lot of us do go, not myself yet, but to Africa, people who want to do safaris or have relatives there in uh, Africa and those are the ones that are the highest risk but as you said uh, you do have to come in contact with an infected animal we do have asymptomatic infected people who don't realize they're infected until about 2 to 21 days later and it is usually in contact with unfortunately um, with feces or with uh, uh, their uh, their well, GI tract yeah. Yeah. So, but it can spread from human to human, Dr. Spock, so we do have to worry about that. Now, there's some debate about whether it can be airborne spread or not. Do uh, you have a view about that, or do you understand any more about that than has been said in the, in the press? Well, what's, what's important about the, the human to human transmission is, is that a lot of times in infectious diseases, you have to understand the behavior of the, of the individuals that are getting infected. The reason there is concern about Ebola is because healthcare workers have been affected. Um, and that is actually reminiscent, once again, of SARS. Uh, when it came to Toronto, I actually know some of the individuals that became sick uh, in that hospital system. Uh, we think that one of the other modes of transmission, though, is really the preparation of the dead body. And there are very, very specific anthropologic practices that are done in a lot of these communities at the time of death 
And this exposure to the fluids, we think, may be one of the sort of high load of, of, of virus. Um, so the casual contact may not be adequate to transmit the virus between person to person. Mm -hmm. And there are two Americans in Atlanta right now who have come back from Africa with the virus are being treated there and in isolation. So there are two people here, but I'm sure that those people are, are very well quarantined off. So there's no Ebola virus. It's not recognized except for those two in this country. This virus actually is in Western Africa. We don't see it anywhere else yet. Is there much chance this could become a worldwide epidemic, Dr. Fa? I doubt it. You know, there's, there, there are concerns about this, but... Uh, really, I mean, we have a tropical hemorrhagic fever. Hemorrhagic fevers are well known. They have a lot of different confusing names. Um, in my opinion, the most concerning hemorrhagic fever for people in North America will be dengue. Uh, and dengue every now and then does bring itself up, but fortunately has not become a generalized epidemic in the sort of subtropical areas. Dr. Katon, the, the symptoms of Ebola virus, are you familiar with those? What can we tell the public about that? A lot of times they can be vague, but it's the bleeding issue, the hemorrhaging, unexplained hemorrhaging that seems to be a hallmark for the virus. But a lot of the other ones are nausea, vomiting, in fact, fevers greater than 100, 203 that are persistent. It's the biggest issue that most people will see. As Dr. Spock said, sometimes you can think about other fevers such as dengue fever for people who are traveling to Dominican Republic or the Caribbean that we have more chance of seeing and we've had one case of that here in Baylor in the last year was one case of dengue fever from someone who was traveling back from the Caribbean recently. And you know the initial symptoms cough, sore muscles, sore joints, headache, fever, some abdominal discomfort, that could be anything. In fact it's much more likely in this country, in fact it's likely to be a virus, flu virus, cold virus, intestinal virus, intestinal infection and it is Ebola. We don't see that in this country. I guess the ones we have to be worried about are the ones who have contact with someone who's had Ebola. I can't imagine Ebola popping up in Dallas, Texas, unless it was somebody who'd been in West Africa or in contact with someone in West Africa. Does that make sense to you, Dr. Spock? Uh, definitely. Uh, I don't anticipate this being something that, as clinicians, we'll, we'll have to see here. You know, there have been a couple of concerning uh, media reports, uh, an individual in New York City who had had West African contacts or alternatively others that had traveled in and out of West Africa to other destinations. Um, I think we need to kind of keep an open mind, recognize that WHO and other health organizations are working hard to get further uh, details so we can answer that better. Yeah, so you have to have contact with someone or some animal who has this already. Now, the problem is the incubation period can be up to three weeks. So uh, during that three-week period of time, you might not have the symptoms. So I'd go back to the contact. If somebody who's had contact with someone in West Africa, maybe. But a friend of mine coming back from Paris, France, no, I, don't, I wouldn't think so. A, a patient of mine who lives here in town, hasn't been out of the country, I wouldn't think that'd be a concern there also. So to calm down some of the hysteria, this virus is pretty well contained to West Africa. There's 2,000 cases. There's not 100,000. There's only two in this country, and they came from there. So nobody in this country is spreading this disease right now in America, so you're not likely to get it here. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that is important when we talk about epidemiology, the basics of epidemiology is actually sort of sixth grade math, remembering, or seventh grade math, looking at kind of numerator and denominator. We don't know other numerators and denominators for West African illnesses. Like, an easy question is, what's the survival for somebody with appendicitis who shows up at a hospital in Liberia? And so, on one hand, we'll say 90% of individuals with Ebola are dying, but hospitals in Liberia are completely different than hospitals in Dallas, Texas. And so it's important to remind our patients that we have 21st century technology here. And in fact, when people were asking me just a few weeks ago, what should, we do about the, what should we do about those two Americans that have Ebola, I said the only chance they have of surviving is get them to America. So go. I commend that they were actually brought to Atlanta. And I suspect they will survive. We will learn a tremendous amount of Ebola thanks to supportive measures in the intensive care. So Dr. Katon, uh, treatment of this condition, um, what's your understanding of that? Well, most of the times, like most viral illnesses, it's mostly supportive. It's to prevent dehydration, respiratory issues, but mostly it's supportive treatment for IV fluids for volume depletion 
to prevent the diarrhea, to prevent the nausea, and then if you need it, a transfusion if needed if you have significant hemorrhage. But usually it's all supportive. I was just thinking as you all were just talking about this, this uh, brings up like the flu issue sometimes where people don't realize that they have the flu for a few days because of the incubation period and they spread it to other people and why it's so important that we have the vaccination. Hopefully one day we may have a vaccination for some of these other viruses. Right. There's no vaccination now for Ebola, but there's a medicine out there, an antibody type medicine, uh, Dr. Spock, uh, ZMAP. Tell us what you know about that. Basically what they're doing with some of these viral illnesses is they're trying to attenuate the immune response. And so using monoclonal antibodies to try and block some of the dysregulation that's promoted by ongoing replication of the virus. So. Um, it makes sense. Uh, the challenging things about these kinds of treatments is production. Um, this stuff has to be made home brew in a lab. So mass production is not possible. So that's why they only have a couple of treatments available um, for these select cases. And to be fair, we don't even know that it works yet. They've tried it in a couple of folks. As I understand, two people actually survived. One died. There may be more recent information, but it hasn't been widely studied to know if it really works well or not at this point. Is that correct? Correct. They, there is no animal model for Ebola. Yeah. Uh, and so jumping straight to clinical human use actually makes sense. I'm glad that the health authority said we need to dispense with the usual phase one, phase two type of sequence. Mm -hmm. Because these are desperate cases. Um, so we should try what we can. What we can. Yep. So, Roger, are you telling your folks to stay away from West Africa right now if they want to go traveling overseas? Yeah, I actually, we have uh, family members who live in Nigeria, and they're the ones who've been emailing and texting Rainer and I, my twin, about the issues about Ebola. But so far, their health department has said that they are relatively safe from a risk because they live on a compound where it's for an industry. But it is uh, it has caused heightened awareness in Nigeria, even though Liberia is where most of the cases are. A lot of people in Nigeria are very, very frightened about it, and a lot of the expatriates who work over there and live here in the States or live in India or Singapore are considering leaving because of the fear of Ebola, which we are trying to calm them down on. But, I mean, there is always that fear. They're much closer than we are to the situation. And to keep up on this virus, I've been looking at the Center for Disease Control website. Also, actually, Wikipedia is up to date on this. So those are two sites you can look for new information about this. Dr. Spock, any other recommendation for the audience as to where they might look for more information about this virus? Uh, when additional information is required, uh, I always encourage patients to go to the WHO websites. Uh, um, interestingly, the WHO websites are specifically written at the college freshman level. So they will be writing it along the same lines as, say, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Um, the CDC writes most of their websites at the 7th or 8th grade level, um, which means that some people may not feel like they're getting enough of the information, but the CDC is deliberately writing it at a slightly lower grade level to get it out to as many individuals as possible. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Dr. Ketan, um, are you worried about this personally? If patients come back from Africa to see you with the cold virus, what I'm, I'm sure you thought about this. What are you going to do? And they say, I've got a cold or I've got some symptoms, but I've been in a dangerous area. What are you going to tell them? I think the patient who comes into my office with a recurrent fever greater than 103, unexplained uh, bleeding, or having nausea, vomiting, and the sore throat, etc., I will probably call the hospital ask them to direct, admit them to an isolation room, and then work from there. That's, I'm not concerned about it for too many of our patients, but I think that I would want to call uh, infectious disease like Dr. Spock or one of his partners to also see them and we would pull it. But I would not be concerned about Ebola for everyone. I'd be more worried, like Dr. Spock was saying, about some of the other viruses that we are more, or that we have more prevalence in Dallas recently. And Dr. Spock, testing for this virus, how would you confirm it if you were confronted with that possibility? If there were a patient uh, uh, that we were worried that actually had Ebola, the CDC has set up a, a hotline, and I would call them directly to facilitate the testing, because obviously we don't have the tests available here uh, in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. 
So the Ebola virus is a horrible virus with a high fatality rate, at least in Africa, where it's been treated. There's been none in this country except two that were imported in. They're in quarantine. Hopefully they're improving well. It's something to think about, particularly with foreign travel. Uh, any final words, Dr. Katon? No, I just hope that everyone remembers to do their normal, wash their hands, protect themselves when they're going traveling, and to talk to their doctor if they should get a fever. Very good. And final words from you, Dr. Spock. My final word will be kind of out there from left field. Everybody, please get your flu shot. There's no word about the flu. Indeed. And thank you for watching another edition of Google's Healthy Hangout. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good work, guys. Thanks. Bye.